All right, guys, welcome to week four. Awesome for making it this far. My name is Marty Orofice, and tonight I'm gonna to show you how I help my son, who is diagnosed with autism, heal and reach his full potential using nutrition and supplementation. Now we've talked about it a few times, but full potential is different for everyone. So our goal for here is to help our children thrive. So before we go in, let's go through a little housekeeping. Um, calls be, will be recorded. Have you guys had a chance to get into the members area yet? I saw a few of you get in there. But anyway, tomorrow we'll be uploading a recording, also the audio and any products that I discuss. It is a work in progress. It is just something that we're looking to put together as a resource for you. So we are continuing to add to it like just about every day, actually, including a lot of the research and the studies, the things that you know, where I'm pulling information from so we can put it in there. So as always, um, get a notebook, go to a quiet place, put your phone away, get those browsers closed down and commit an all, uh, commit at least one hour to go all in with me. And you may get one of those nuggets that changes your child's life forever. Um, questions as you get them, put them into the chat bar. And what I'll do is I'll stick around at the end, answer them for you, and we'll go from there. I'm going to give you information steps, then it's up to you to implement. And when we're talking about the stuff, especially tonight, it's, it's good to understand that the idea here isn't to be perfect. Perfection isn't possible. We're here to do our best, make the best choices we can for our children. And once we understand that our choices do make a huge difference, then it's much, much easier to make better choices. So I'm human. I make mistakes. And with the stuff tonight, you realize that perfection is an absolute impossibility, totally. The toxins and the issues with our environment are all around us to a point where there's really no escape. And we've talked about you know, pesticides being in our rain and everything else. Um, tonight, it, it gets even more in depth. So that said, let's look at tonight's content with the frame that we can control and remove 90% of the toxins in our food and environment that cause problems for our kids. And the point here tonight isn't just to learn a bunch and walk away smarter with a bigger brain. Um, the idea here is to give you the tools required to make better decisions and help heal your child. So my goal for this training, well, I have a few goals. Number one is to show you the hidden toxins that are in our food and our environment that hurt our children. Uh, number two, we're going to be giving you strategies for eating out, dealing with family. Um, what do you do in fast food situations, picnics, things like that. And I want to give you the confidence to read labels and understand what's happening in the body with the ingredients on those labels. So I really want you guys to have the knowledge and confidence to handle any situation that's thrown at you and be able to adapt. It's really easy for me to say, oh, buy this toothpaste or, you know, do something it's just that we live in this really fluid environment where some companies are around today, they're not around tomorrow. Chemicals are constantly changing the things that are being used. So it's empowering you with the skills, strategies, and frameworks so that you can make your own informed decisions, not just following a checklist. So some of the information when I was going through this and just compiling and putting it together candidly disgusted me. And you know, that said, it's important for me to show you what to look for when you're out and about. So also, guys, I am looking for testimonials, wins, success stories. Um, have you guys done your homework? Have you bought the supplements? Have you started the eating plans? Have you done any of that? And I expect to see yes, 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 all the way around. We had to talk about commitment before. And the more committed you are to this, the better results you're going to see. Before we get started, I'm not a doctor. Don't pretend to be one. I'm a father. I do a ton of research, do experiments, and I've had unbelievable results. So everything expressed here is my opinion and not to be, um, you know, to be looked at as medical advice by any stretch of the imagination. So do your own research. So last week was pretty amazing, wasn't it? We covered a ton, got super practical. Um, we learned specifically how to implement the 2R eating and supplementation plan. We learned what supplements to take and when to take them. And we learned that just because something is marketed as a health food or gluten-free doesn't mean it's at all healthy. Sometimes it's just the opposite. We learned about the concept of bookends in our day and how to take the guesswork out of two-thirds of our day. 
and food replacements and typical meals that I serve my son and, you know, the system for doing that and how to make better purchasing decisions, learning how to read the labels and see through the marketing messages to see the truth about a product. If you remember the example between the classic Lay's potato chips and the baked Lay's. Are you guys seeing how powerful this information is? Yeah, good. The big thing to remember tonight is that our children already have sensitive systems. I know we've talked about it a bunch, but they do. They have extremely sensitive systems. So when you load up their bodies with poisons and things that require their body to fight and process, then there's not as much cellular energy and capacity to use towards growing and developing. So for our kids, when I go through this stuff tonight, it's especially imperative to remove the toxins and the, and the things that we're going to go through. So let's get started right away and dive in how to handle one of the most common situations that you'll encounter eating out at a restaurant. So when it comes to eating out at restaurants, you want to have a few guiding principles. Every restaurant's different. Every, you know, every environment's different. But if you have principles, then you can just use those in any situation. So the first principle is never, and I mean never, order from a kid's menu. Anyone guilty of this one? Yeah, it's, it's always the same and always full of absolute garbage. Like, I don't know, for some reason, when people think, oh, we're going to give kids food it's like hey let's give them the worst of the worst it's the the crappy burger the chicken fingers the grilled cheese the hot dog the mac and cheese all of the lowest quality okay so that's number one principle number two is to just keep it very simple do you remember the plate the diagram that we had last week from the 2r system there was the protein the vegetable and then the fat and the fruit that's what we're looking to do at any type of restaurant situation. And sometimes you don't have the option and that's totally cool, but that is our framework and what we're aiming towards. So I'll just walk through a few examples. Um, if you're ordering from a Mexican restaurant, what I will do is I will get something like the fajitas, chicken fajitas with a corn tortilla instead of flour, flour avoiding the gluten. Now, is it genetically modified? Yes. Is it full of pesticides? Yes. Is it better than a, hot dog on a bun with french fries yes so and think about it you have your meat you have your vegetables you have your fat with the avocado and not really a fruit but you have three out of four which isn't too bad so if i'm going to a barbecue place i will get like a piece of roasted chicken and then some vegetables are you guys seeing the pattern here sitting on the beach at a tiki bar which I just did a week ago. Fish tacos on corn tortillas. Is it perfect? No, but you're getting, you know, you're getting your meat and the fat with the uh, guacamole, things like that. So at, every, at a restaurant environment, I'll usually go with chicken or fish. If I order red meat, it'll be the leanest cut they have, like a filet mignon, and then I'll just cut off and give some to my son. Now, the reason being is that the chemicals, hormones, and medications that are in all conventionally raised cows accumulate in their fat. So the fattier cut you get, you guessed it, the more toxins you're getting. Now, it's interesting because the exact opposite is true if you're eating cows that are grass-fed and organic. Now, it's extremely hard to find in certain parts of the country. If you're in San Diego or you know certain parts of Colorado, you know, the they have that type of thing at restaurants. Most of the rest of the country is still playing catch up. So in that case though, I would choose a fattier cut of meat because more fat has more nutrients if it's grass fed and organic. So the meat itself has more antioxidants, omega-3s, minerals, vitamins, all the really good stuff that we want. So once again, just as an overall, we wanna focus on real food not the chicken tenders that are breaded that have like 50 ingredients that we can't uh, pronounce one of them. It's just keep it simple, keep it simple, and we can minimize the damage that we're doing to our children at these establishments. All right, well, let's say we're not at a sit down restaurant. What if we are eating fast food? Once again, I'll start by saying that fast food is not the best option by any stretch of the imagination. The food is almost never organic, typically very low quality. And the ingredients in something like grilled chicken looks like a science experiment. That said, 
in our culture and our environment and our lifestyle, eating out is a part of our, our life. So we have to do it. So my goal here is just to minimize damage and keep things, like I said, as simple as possible. What I've done is I put up three fast food places that I will go or have gone in the past. Uh, Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, and Boston Market. I just did these as examples. What you can do is just use those principles and guidelines and make choices at other places that are, are similar. So at Chick-fil-A, what I will do is do grilled chicken nuggets and then just a small, they have a little small cup with cut up fruit and a glass of water. And my son absolutely loves that. And he, every day, if we drive by Chick-fil-A, can we get Chick-fil-A, can we get Chick-fil-A? He absolutely loves it. So, you know, you can get over that Chipotle. We go in there and we will order a big salad with the grilled chicken and the rice. You know, I have a picture of it up on here with the guacamole and everything. And then we'll just get the thing of chips on the side. Not that they're great, but it's just like a little bit of a treat for, for going out. And at Boston market, what's cool about Boston market is they actually do have real food. So they have the, you know, the rotisserie chickens. So I just get a chicken and then a side of vegetables and things like that. And the real key here is just to go beyond sandwiches, go beyond Subway and all of the other extremely low quality where you can't find a single bit of real food. And at any of these places as well, stay away from the kids menu. It just has cow's milk, sugar laden juice, all that, all that type of stuff. Okay. So what happens when you're going to a birthday party and Every birthday party I've been to, you typically just find like really cheap kids food, which is 95% of the time is pizza, which I'm not sure. It's just like, hey, there's kids there. Let's just throw all the crap at them. So first thing that I'll do is I'll reach out to the host and ask what they're serving and then plan accordingly. So number one, if I know that it's not going to be a ton of food that they'll be able to have is I'll just feed them a big meal right before we go to the party. And that way it's just not like going nuts like you turn around and his face is in like a, a bag of goldfish or something like that. So that's one. I will coordinate with the host about another option. I'll say, Hey, are you having anything else for the adults or is that all? And you'd be surprised. Most people are very accommodating. I will bring a safe food with me. Um, <laughs> and I know this sounds like a little bit of work, but I will make my own homemade pizza and then just bring it in a Ziploc bag or I'll bring with me just a bag of organic corn chips or cut up fruit, things that he can have that won't cause as many issues. Um, I realize that one, you know, it's a little bit more work, but it is what it is. If I'm going to a place like Monkey Joe's, and let me tell you, I don't know if you guys have Monkey Joe's where you guys live, but it's a place with like bounce houses and they have birthday parties, but there's just, there was a stretch a few months ago where I felt like I was there at least once a week for a month and a half. And all they serve there is pizza. So what I would do is I just went to the kitchen and I would just, as soon as I got there, and be like, hey, like an order of chicken wings. Not perfect, but a chicken wing is better than the pizza that they serve there. Or in extreme circumstances, which I don't like to do, is I will say, hey, we will just go out to eat after and then just take them out to some place like uh, Chick-fil-A and things like that. Okay, now if you're going to a picnic, what I typically do is I'll just bring, I showed you guys last week the meat alternatives and there's the grass fed organic hot dogs that you can get at Trader Joe's for, you know, just a few dollars. I'll just bring those and say, hey, like I went to a karate picnic a few weeks ago and I just said, hey, oh, I didn't know we were supposed to bring meat. You know, you mind if I throw these dogs on the grill? And that was it. So, you know, I realized that this is more thought and planning than just going with the flow and letting our kids have what everyone else is having uh, because it does require a little bit more effort. I always have to tie back to my why. And my job as a father is to help my son reach his potential. And doing that, it is to, you know, remove things that are in his world that can cause him harm. And since you now know the science behind what's happening in the body and some of the issues that it causes, it's so much easier to make those difficult choices and spend the little bit of extra time that it takes planning and prepping. Uh, for theme parks or days out, I will prep extra food and snacks to take along with me. You know, saving the eating out 
when we really need to or on special occasions. And you can reference back to last week, I went through, you know, the exhaustive list of different types of snack ideas and lunches and things like that that I pack. All right, so now that we have discussed strategies for eating out, let's dive into a topic that's a little bit spicy. Okay, quick question. Would you ever let your child chew on a yoga mat? Hmm. Eat a car tire, eat the soles of his shoes, or just rip apart that couch and start chewing on the stuffing in there, on that couch cushion. Well, I mean, do, do we have any takers here? Are we gonna let our kids do that? Obviously not, but it's pretty close to what's happening when we give our children the normal kids' foods. Now, there are a bunch of ingredients that are commonly used in our food that are banned in large parts of the world that could even get you 15 years in jail for using them in food. Can you imagine that? That's pretty scary, isn't it? Now let's dive in and uh, learn how we can avoid these bad boys. So this is our around the world tour of banned in the rest of the world. Okay, the first one is a preservative. Uh, there's two of them, BHA and BHT. Now just know that I'm not gonna go into every single one. I'm gonna go into the biggest ones that cause issues and then teach you how to read the labels and we can go from there. Now this one is banned in England, many other European countries, Japan, and it's found that BHA causes cancer in rats. It can also trigger allergic reactions and hyperactivity in humans. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. And BHT can cause organ system toxicity, everyone's favorite thing. Okay, so this is found in butter, meats, breakfast cereals, chewing gum, dehydrated potatoes, beer, and some of the companies and products that are used, uh, Post, Kellogg's, Quaker cereals, Chex Mix, Diamond Nuts, which I have up there, Wrigley's, Trident, Bazooka, Bubble Yum Gums, all those type of things. So what I want you to do is, I'm not sure if you could see this, but look at the label, okay? And the very last line of the ingredient list says what? Freshness preserved by BHT. That's it, that's all you have to look for. When you're reading labels, you see that huge ingredient list, you see the hydrogelized soy protein, which we'll get to in a little bit, you see all these ingredients, that are toxic for our children, and then you can just make a different choice. And as you start to get practice reading labels and all that type of stuff, these bad boys are going to jump it out at you. So don't worry about that. All right, what's next on the list? The next one is called Olestra, and this one is a fat substitute or a fake fat. I mean, it's just, they've created a fake fat. Uh, Procter & Gamble, this was their love child, and it's currently banned in Canada and the UK. And it has a very, very prestigious distinction. Time Magazine named it one of the 50 worst inventions ever. But that hasn't stopped food companies from using this to satisfy people's false belief that having a fat-free snack alternative is healthier. It makes zero sense. But here's some of the facts about Alestra. Rats fed potato chips with Olestra gained weight. So you're eating a food to help you lose weight, yet it makes you gain weight. There's adverse intestinal reactions, including diarrhea cramps in everyone's favorite. Yeah, you got it, leaky bowels. And it interferes with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. So we already have children that have nutrient deficiencies. Prove it. They have issues with their gut. Prove it. And now we're introducing a food that does what? Gives more intestinal issues and stops the absorption of vitamins and minerals that they sorely need. So for our kids, not the best. Now this one, whew, okay. The next ingredient is called brominated vegetable oil, BVO for short. And it's just used to prevent flavoring from uh, floating to the surface in bed. Uh, beverages, okay? So <laughs> BVO is a flame retardant that's used in things like furniture, tires, electronics, certain sodas, and sports drinks. 
So it is banned in more than 100 countries. I mean, it's incredible. And it's a toxic endocrine distributor. So it can damage your thyroid, lead to cancer, infertility, schizophrenia, and many other serious diseases. And if you have a child that's born, they've tested mothers that have had higher levels of these chemicals in their bodies. The kids have lower IQs. They perform poorly in mental and physical development tests. And yeah, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff that it's linked to. In 2014, Coke and Pepsi both said, hey guys, we're not gonna be using this. We're gonna be phasing it out at some point. That said, three years later and buy a Mountain Dew and see what's in the back. It's still in there. So what you have to do is make sure you're reading labels and looking for brominated vegetable oil. And just think, every time you see the little kid grabbing the Gatorade, they're drinking a flame retardant that's banned in over 100 countries around the world that leads to lower IQ and all sorts of problems. And this is what we market and give to our kids as healthy, right? It's just not the case. I mean, everyone can agree that Mountain Dew, not the healthiest thing. But when you think of Gatorade, you know, you're like, hey, they, they're playing soccer. Let's get them a Gatorade. Uh, maybe time to rethink that strategy, especially with our kids, with their sensitive system. You know, we just need to eliminate those things. Okay. The next chemical that's banned around the world is called potassium bromate. And it's basically the, contains the same toxic chemical as BVO, the one we just talked about but it also causes more cancers and damages cells DNA. So what this, what it's used for though, is to decrease the time needed for baking. So you can reduce the cost in baking breads and all different things like that. It's been Europe, Canada, China, UK, Brazil. I've just put a few here, but just know that this is banned or used in hundreds of products. You know, you get the nature's only bread, thinking you're doing something good. Hey, I'm getting whole grain bread. And then you have, then you have this, uh, this in here. It's just crazy. All right. And the next one, this bad boy, I don't even know how to pronounce it. This definitely does not roll off the tongue. I'm gonna give it a shot. Azodicarbonamide. I don't know. Good enough. Yeah. You can find this, this beautiful, chemical in yoga mats, sneaker soles, and other foamed plastics. Um, it's found in just about five, over 500 food products from Pillsbury dinner rolls, Little Debbie, Wonder Bread, all those classic foods I know that I used to eat as a kid. And these are to cause cancer, asthma, allergies, all sorts of things like that. Stroman's bread, Entenmann's hungry. I mean, these are all like these big names, right? Betty Crocker, and then I also have a little, the bottom of a shoe there because it's, it's used in the bottom of shoes. So interesting fact about this one. If you're caught using this chemical as a food ingredient in Singapore, 15 years in prison and fined a half a million dollars. Probably not the best thing to be putting in our child sensitive systems. Can you guys see how this could be harmful? Yeah? All right. Let's move, moving right along. All right, RBGH and RBST. What, what these things are, you may have seen them on milk packages and things like that, but these are genetically modified growth hormones and they're the largest selling dairy animal drug in America and is another one of those Monsanto classics. It's banned in over 30 nations and what it's used for is they just inject this stuff into cows to help increase milk production. And it has been proven around the world to significantly increase cancer risk. However, the United States, 100% fine. So one of the problems with this one is that it makes cows really sick. So they get really sick when they're treated with this, and then they need a whole bunch of antibiotics, which is passed to us in dairy products like milk, meat, cheese, things like that. So how does that affect our kids? Well, the more antibiotics we're consuming, it affects the gut health of our children because it kills off the beneficial gut bacteria. As we've spent you know, weeks going over, that is the critical element, heal the gut, heal the brain, heal our children. So 
So it just goes in there and it wreaks havoc on that. There's a whole bunch of other things of what they need to do in order to keep these cows sick it, or to keep them um, alive so that they can continue to produce milk. But you're getting dairy products from sick animals and sick animals produce sick food. Can you see how that would be a bad thing for your kids? Yeah. All right, the next one, it's a fun one, MSG. Now when I first think of MSG, I think of Chinese food. I think most people have that same thought. Not anymore, MSG or monosodium glutamate. And I just said that because I want you to, uh, we're gonna be talking about that in a little bit. So it's monosodium glutamate. It's found in 95% of processed and packaged foods. So the entire inside of the grocery store most likely has MSG in there. Now MSG is an excitotoxin, which it sounds like it's an exciting thing, it's not. What happens is it overexcites your brain cells until they are damaged or die. So when that causes brain damage to varying degrees, uh, potential, potentially even worsening or triggering learning disabilities. Now, quick nerd alert, we're gonna get a little bit deeper into science here. Too much glutamate inhibits brain development and is shown to be a potential neurotoxin that kills brain cells and has been implicated, is, plays a huge role in autism. So our kids, when you look at, uh, they have really high levels of glutamate and that's that neurotoxin that kills brain cells and, you know, and interrupts brain function. So now we're taking MSG, that, and they already have a high level of glutamate, along with dysfunctional glutamate receptors, and then you pile on top more. You continue to add to that. You just continue to add something toxic on already toxic levels in a sensitive child. No bueno. And the hard part about MSG is that there's so many different names for it, and it's, you know, it's hidden in food products. So I'm just gonna bring these up here, and you can just take a look at them quickly. Obviously, this presentation will be in there in the members area, so you can you know, look at these. But when you just look at things like natural flavors, I mean, that seems like, wow, it's natural, it's flavoring, it's cool. Big issues there, especially, especially, especially for our kids. So whatever you need to do, and that's why staying out of that middle aisle is so important, um, like I know for me, I should not be drinking like five hour energies and occasionally I'll be exhausted and I'll just be like, Hey, let me take it. I just read the back of one, uh, a couple days ago. And it's like the second ingredient is MSG. And I'm like, Oh, that's why I feel dumber after I drink that. All right. The next is sugar alternative. So the past few weeks we've talked about reducing that sugar intake for our kids. And many times when I say something like that, I just see people replacing a soda with a diet soda or getting a no sugar option. Now the issue with that is that real sugar is simply replaced with a chemical alternative that can be just as bad or worse than consuming sugar. So let's just take a look at a few of the common um, sugar alternatives and what we need to do is steer clear of them. The first one is sucralose, AKA Splenda. That is the yellow packet on the picture there. And a Duke University study found that sucralose decreased good gut bacteria by 50%. I don't need to explain to this, I'm just beating a dead horse about gut health, but things that alter our microbiome in a negative way is awful for our kids. So just by using Splenda, thinking we're doing a good thing, we're actually hurting their immune system, hurting their brain and everything else. Okay, the next one is called saccharin or sweet and low. And just pretty basic, around 20 years ago, this product was banned, like not used in products because they was found to cause cancer. And I don't know what happened, but somehow it got back into our food supply and everything else. So it has a spotted past and it would just, better to stay away from this one. And one of the worst, worst, worst ones out there is called aspartame. It's found in over 6,000 products worldwide, including all the like diet sodas and things like that. Aspartame is an excitotoxin, 
excitotoxin. So it excites those brain cells until they die. Same thing as MSG. The other interesting thing is that it converts into formaldehyde in the body, which is the same stuff that's used to embalm a corpse. Now, there's over 900 published studies revealing the detrimental effects of aspartame, yet it's still allowed in our food supply. Aspartame accounts for 75% of all adverse reactions to food additives. That's according to the FDA. And it's been linked to cancer, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, dizziness, seizures, depression, migraines, breathing difficulties, weight gain, and the top aspartame researchers in the nation also warned that it is a contributing factor in the skyrocketing autism rates. And it's by way of methanol toxicity. And it's made of three different things. I won't get too into detail, but it's, there's methanol in it and that gets converted into formaldehyde. And they're saying that that is causing um, issues with the autism as well. And then, this is a fun one, neotame is just aspartame slightly altered with a new name. So anytime there's something really bad, we just change the name, alter the structure a little bit, and then rebrand it. So don't be fooled, it's just as bad. I found this, which I thought was interesting, which is just autism prevalence in the US and you know matched up with the consumption of aspartame. Like I said before, when we're looking at these charts, causation does not mean correlation but it does make you just go, hmm, okay. You know, we have all these different environmental factors, all these different chemicals, all these different things that have been just skyrocketing in the past 20, 30 years. Okay, so now that we talked about what not to have, what should we have? What should we use? What are things that are safer that we can still get that uh, sweet taste when we need it? So xylitol is number one. I'm not gonna go into why and everything else, just know that these are sugar alcohols, they're better alternatives, and they do not have the damaging effect on the body and brain as the other ones did. So xylitol, urethral, if I said that right, stevia, monk fruit extract, and raw honey. Now, what I do is I typically use honey and stevia mostly. And I'll use stevia in my coffee instead of sugar or anything else. And honey, you can do so much with honey. Yesterday, it was my birthday, made up some chocolate mousse out of avocado and honey. This was like delicious. And that was our little cupcake things. And my son's saying happy birthday and everything, and he can have it. And raw honey is incredible natural food that we can use to sweeten things. All right, let's get into food dyes. Seems pretty innocent enough, right? But research shows that food dyes are associated with the following, following problems, hyperactivity, allergies, learning impairment, irritability, aggressiveness, and sleep disturbances. Any of those sound familiar? Anyone? Yeah. Now the interesting thing is that most of these artificial colors are made from coal tar. Coal tar is used in seal coating products that protect the shine of industrial floors. It's also used in uh, head lice shampoos to kill the critters. You see why our kids' sensitive systems, not a good thing? Yeah. And from the yogurt that you have in the morning to the cupcake sprinkles that are on you know, dessert and just about every other manufactured food contains coal tar in the form of artificial colors. Now, I'm not gonna get into the real dirt. I had it on the first version of this. It just was like, it was a little bit too overwhelming. So the few of the worst offenders to watch out for, citrus red two, blue one and two, red three and number 40, yellow five and six. What I do, this is just my guideline, my principle. When I see artificial colors and dyes, I just don't buy it. I just look for products that either have natural dyes or I don't get them. So these have been banned, same thing around the world, each one in different countries, some more than others, but you know, they've just been linked to also cancer, DNA mutation, nerve growth, 
I mean, just, just crazy. So it's interesting. Red number three was banned for tropical, topical use in 1990, yet it's still sold in our foods and beverages. Hmm. We can rub it on our, it's illegal to rub it on our skin, but we can put it in our kids' candy and let them eat it. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's crazy. Okay, so where are these things found? Candy, cereal, sports drinks, American cheese, mac and cheese, carbonated beverages, gelatin desserts like uh, Jello type stuff, baked goods, fruit cocktail, cherry pie mix, ice cream, candy, and even pet food. It's crazy. And the crazy thing is that these are all totally unnecessary in companies like all the big ones, right? Nestle, Kraft, Mars, Kellogg's, even McDonald's. They don't use these in Europe where they opt for natural colorings. Not at all. And I, so I was just doing, I was looking through um, my refrigerator and I, I pulled out pickles and I was looking on there for, um, you know, the artificial colors. And I get the, I got the pickles at LD and it's a German company and it was, and they were flavored with turmeric and or, uh, the color was with turmeric, which is a natural one. So the companies don't have to use this. I just think it's a little bit cheaper. And since it's not banned in the U S they can continue to do it. But the products that they're shipping overseas are illegal. So they have to change the formulations. Very eye-opening. So I have up here the, you know, you know what this is, Skittles. Just look at the ingredient list there. I, I don't even have all of it, but it's like red 40, yellow five, yellow five lake, yellow six, blue two, blue one, blue one. And then everyone's favorite ingredient, carnauba wax, which is what we put on our cars to wax the cars. All good, good stuff. All right, so let's get away from food for a second and get into household toxins. Now, the toxins are literally everywhere. And I do not want this, like, just as a saying, you don't want to be overly paranoid and, you know, everyone's out to get you and that type of thing. The reason I'm going through this is just because we have to be aware and have a, an elevated level of consci consciousness to know that make educated choices on what we're buying because what we're buying has a direct impact on the toxicity levels of us, our families, our kids, and everyone around. So we talked about, I think it was the first week, where researchers found that over 300 chemicals were in the umbilical cord of newborn babies. And of those, we know that 180 cause cancer in human and animals, 217 are toxic to the brain and nervous system. This is in the umbilical cord. Like these kids are coming in already pre-polluted and 208 cause birth defects or abnormal development. We literally could spend a week going through all the different to household toxins, but I don't think that would serve us. Our goal is to eliminate toxic exposure as much as possible. That includes the ones in our environment, the ones that we consume in our food and the ones that we put on our skin that get absorbed. And in order to achieve this goal of healing our children, we need to limit our children's exposure to toxins. And we need to be aware of the types of products, where the toxins lurk, and find better alternatives. And additionally, knowing that there is so much out there, we need to build up our children's immune systems by healing their gut, giving them things like sulforaphane, which I went over last week, which is the broccoli sprout extract, which helps detox the body, phase two detoxification. Increasing glutathione, which if you remember, there was like those little Roomba vacuum going around cleaning up free radicals and oxidative stress. We need to increase those levels so that their, our kids can let their body flush these out naturally. Okay, so that said, let's just focus on two of the big ones that are in most household items, and then we'll go into a little bit more specifics. So the first one, I don't even know how to pronounce it, phthalates or I don't know, whatever that is. This is found in most of the fragrant household products, food packaging, cosmetics, personal care, air fresheners, dish soap. Anytime you see the word fragrance on a label, there's a good chance that these guys are present. Now, these guys are endocrine disruptors, and researchers have also linked these to asthma, ADHD, breast cancer, obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, low IQ, neurodevelopment. Neurodevelopmental issues, behavioral issues, 
fertility and reproductive issues. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know the little plugins that you put in the wall and it just spreads that nice scent around? That's what these guys are in. Your laundry detergent that smells wonderful, like everything that has that scent, they use this chemical because it helps, it does a really good job of letting it fly through the air. Just not a good thing to uh, be giving our kids more toxins to deal with. All right, the next one is called par parabens. Oh, just one last thing on the, I'll just call them phthalates, I don't know how to pronounce it, is that they're not required to be on labels. So you're not gonna be able to read on the back of a label. So what that means is that when you're buying products, you need to look for things that are fragrance free. Things that you know are organic, that can't use these type of chemicals. All right, now parabens, they are on labels. And what these do is these just help things last longer on the shelf. And they're in personal care, uh, shampoos, conditioners, deodorants, sunscreens, all that type of stuff. And the EPA has linked parabens to metabolic, developmental, hormonal, and neurological issues, as well as cancer. Now, these are just two. There are tons more. So when it, like I said, when it comes to products that are dangerous for kids, we could literally spend a week going through everything. And my goal is not to give you the exact, you know, don't buy this, buy this. Products, companies, they're constantly changing. So my goal is to give you principles and systems that you can use whenever you're out making purchasing decisions. Now, there is an app called EWG Healthy Living App. And I encourage you guys all to go out and download this. This is actually part of your homework for this week. What this does, it allows you to scan a product, the barcode, and then it gives you the dangerous things in them. Like I said, I can't go through all of the toxins. The toxins in sunscreen alone, like make your head spin. So you just use this app and it tells you if the product's good, bad, or in the middle of the road type thing like that. So, a great place to start is just, I know it can be overwhelming, you need to go throw out everything. No, just think about it like this. Whenever you need to go buy something new, laundry detergent, dish soap, things like that, my suggestion is just to put a little bit more thought into those products. And like I said, one of my favorite ways to do it is just hit it with that app. Okay, so let's walk through the list of places that we can find different things. All-purpose cleaners, um, baby bath products, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, hand soap, laundry detergents, moisturizers and lotions, sunscreen, toothpaste, air fresheners, diapers, couches, cookware. And when you have that nonstick cookware and you're starting to get those chips, those chemicals are seeping in your body and not good. What I'll do is I'll just show you a few. Okay, so with toothpaste, you do not want to get fluoride in your toothpaste. I do not care what the dentist said. Fluoride is a neurotoxin, which means it is poisonous for your brain. So got this one. Jack and Jill natural toothpaste. So what I did is I just looked it up, looked it up in the app. I was like, okay, this is this works. Uh, for things like cleaning, honest company, this stuff, multi-surface cleaner. I have this stuff as well, Myers. I didn't really like the smell. I really like the smell of this one. Laundry detergent, free and clear. So there's um, fra no fragrances, dyes, artificial brighteners. Same thing with, you know, the little laundry, little, little pouches here. No fragrances, dyes, or chlorine, chlorine bleach. Another one, hand wash refill, right? It, no synthetic fragrances dyes, phthalates, like it's, you know, these are much better options when you realize that those products are, are actually poisoning us. So a uh, few companies that I know now that I will lean on, um, Seventh Generation, Honest Company, um, Myers, companies like that tend to have good availability in stores like Walmart and Target and things like that. But, you know, you're just baby Gannix. That's another one that I've used at Target for sunscreen and things like that. They're good. They're changing all the time though. So it's your job to figure out the labels, use the app and do that. 
All right, so let's move on. Now water is one of those things that I think we take for granted, right? It comes out of the tap. We trust that our states and municipalities are doing a good job of getting the bad stuff out. You know, we hear about things like Flint, Michigan, but they're doing a good job in our part of the state or wherever. The reality is nothing could be farther from the truth. <laughs> Among other things, and I'm not gonna go into everything because it is literally like this, I was like, my brain was exploding as I was going through this. But here's what could be in your water. Um, most municipalities put fluoride into the water. So we're drinking a neurotoxin. Why? Because they say that it'll help uh, reduce cavities. I don't, I couldn't find any evidence that it actually did that. Um, chlorine, which is fun, that turns into hydrochloric acid in your gut. Uh, lead, which is toxic to almost every organ and developmental issues. It's linked to autism, all that stuff. We have pipes that are, uh, you know, rusting out from the inside. Things like that happen at Flint. They're happening all over the country. Mercury, PCBs, which are just these industrial chemicals that, you know, are, are very toxic. Arsenic, the, the list keeps going on and on. They just had a research from Harvard that just found the industrial chemicals, PFAs, PFAS is linked with cancer, other health problems, where it exceeded federal safe drinking um, levels in 33 states. Now, if that's not bad enough, let's just watch this quick video from our good friends at CNN. Really, whether you need it or not, it's a virtual medicine cabinet in your tap water. If you live in many, many areas across the country, there's a scary new report out today. The Associated Press did a, a big uh, amount of research on this, and the findings show that there were traces of prescription drugs in the water supply used by 41 million Americans in some of the biggest cities in the U.S. The list includes over-the-counter pain medication, mood stabilizers, even hormones. CNN's Elizabeth Cohen joins us now from the medical update desk in Atlanta. First, uh, explain where they found it and what it is that they found, Elizabeth. Well, the Associated Press, Karen, they spent five months investigating this, and they looked at various municipal water supplies. Not all of them keep track of whether or not they're pharmaceuticals, but the ones that do, they all had traces of various medicines. I'm going to give you a list. This will give you some idea of the kinds of things that they found. For example, in Atlanta, where I am right now, they found that the water contained traces of antibiotics, blood pressure drugs, in Cincinnati, cholesterol drugs, they found a trace of one of those, and estrogen that women sometimes take for medicinal reasons. And in New York, City's, they found, New York City, they found a trace of a seizure drug and an anti-anxiety drug. Now, to give you sort of the big picture, how many drugs did they find in the drinking water? In Philadelphia, they found trace amounts of 56 different drugs. In New York City, they found traces of 16 drugs, and in northern New Jersey, 13 drugs. Now, the question that right now is on everyone's mind is how in the world did drugs get into our drinking water? Well, it's, it's, it's not very pretty, and I'll give you that sort of sanitized version. We all take drugs, and our body does not absorb 100% of everything. Some of it passes through our body, ends up in sewage. Sewage is then treated and ends up back in the water system. So of course, the next question is, well, what about bottled water? Well, I, I hate to sound so pessimistic here. Bottled water often just is repackaged tap water. And, and that doesn't help us much at all either. Or even sometimes if it's spring water, it could still possibly contain these trace amounts. Humans basically have an impact everywhere. Wow. I get sick to my stomach thinking about that. So what do we do? Um, my suggestion is get an under the sink reverse osmosis filter system. Um, you want to get at least a five stage system. There's ones that go up to 10 stages. You just want to make sure that there's, uh, you know, the, the carbon and charcoal filters as well as reverse osmosis. And since you're taking all the minerals out, it's nice to have like a six stage, which put some of the minerals back in the water uh, that alkalizes, or alkalizes them a little bit. Okay, sounds like this real big thing, right? 200 bucks or less, you can get them on Amazon and it'll remove 99% of the crap that's in the water. So, does that just blow your mind? I mean, it kills me. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's dive into shopping, walking around the store and reading labels.
and what do labels really mean? So the FDA has approved certain words that have implied meanings that may be misleading for products. So let's learn the truth about the words that can con us into buying products for our children that we don't really want to buy. So the word natural should not contain synthetic or artificial ingredients. So when I hear the word natural, I'm like, wow, okay, it's natural, it's good. And it doesn't have synthetic artificial ingredients, that's cool. But they can contain high fructose corn syrup, partially hydrated vegetable oil, modified food starch, uh, hormones, pesticides, antibiotics, chemical fertilizers, genetic engineering, and even sewage sludge in your natural products. So now when you see the word natural, it's not looking so good, is it? No. Now, next word is organic. And this is a word that means that the food that we're eating should be free of hormones, toxic pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, chemical fertilizers, genetic engineering, sewage sludge, and genetically modified organisms. Now, uh, sometimes a manufacturer will use words like made with organic, which just simply means that it's not fully organic. And I actually got fooled by this um, the other week. Actually, it was about a week ago. So I was in the store and I just put up, the, you know, the pictures here and I picked up the chips. I don't know, the ones on the left, you can see that they say organic. The labels are extremely similar. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but the little, the blue thing says made with organic corn. So when you, when you look at them side by side, they are almost identical but one just says it, it's made with organic corn and it's not fully organic. And what that means is that the product can have um, up to 70 or it has 70% or more organic material. And then, so in this case, they're not using organic oil. So the whole thing with this is that you can get tricked into thinking you're buying fully organic and you're not. So always read the ingredients because it may just, you know, so you're getting what you think you're getting. Okay, so let's say we're shopping for meat. What do we look for? Now, let's talk about seafood first. Um, the key here is to find fish that have been caught out in the wild and not a factory farm. And you'll see this on the label. You can see it here. Wild caught Alaskan sockeye salmon. And let's just take a look at salmon, for example, because in, and if we compare the difference between wild caught versus factory farmed, the differences are staggering. Not only are they lower in every nutrient, but the fish are fed genetically modified fish meal and receive antibiotics as well as artificial colors to make them look pink and more appetizing. I won't get into what that causes because um, there's something a little bit more detrimental, is that tests that show that farmed salmon contain 16 times more toxic PCB than wild salmon. 16 times more of this particular toxin. And now these are things, this is a chemical that's illegal worldwide, yet still in our environment just because so much has been dumped over the years. This has been linked to cancer, developmental issues, hormones, immune system. Like I could literally just go read a list of what this has been linked to. Worldwide, it's been banned. You name it, this chemical causes it. And if you're buying just salmon that's factory farmed, you're getting 16 times more levels. And this is just a total interesting fact today. Did you guys know that in 2015, the FDA approved genetically modified salmon, which is the first genetically modified animal approved for human consumption? It's, I don't think it's on uh, store shelves yet, and I think that would be a tough one. But anyway, we're moving towards that, just something to keep an eye on. And we've already talked about beef and other meats last week, so we're just gonna keep it really simple here. Buy organic grass-fed beef products, and save your children and yourself from the harmful toxins and hormones that are in there. So just really simple. All right. When it comes to poultry, why would we get organic? And then the safest bet, I'm just going to walk through some, there's three like main labels that you're looking at when you're buying poultry that'll help you determine how good it is. One, organic. So there's no pesticides, GMOs, chemical fertilizers, hormones, and antibiotics. All that stuff is great, right? And we also have, uh, if you heard the word pasture, and what pasture means is that, you know, that at some point in the day, the poultry can go outside and walk around. And when you get pastured poultry, it just has a higher nutrient density because they can go in and pet grubs and have more of like what they would naturally get. 
And the last label that you'll see on packaging is called air chilled. And most chickens, before they're processed, they just go on these things and they're dunked into this community tank of chlorine bath. It's like a big bath and they just dunk all of them in there. So um, the chickens or the poultry that's dunked in there produce 80% more bacteria counts than chickens than are. So air chilled means that they're air chilled and not dunked in this chlorine bath. So something to look out for. If you can only get one, just make sure it's organic. But if you wanna get like extreme and make sure that you're getting everything, then you know, get organic, get pasture, get air chilled, things like that. All right, this absolutely blew my mind. Okay, when it's not organic, the FDA allows, allows poultry farmers to feed their birds arsenic. Huh, it's interesting. It's a known carcinogen and they do it because it um, improves feed efficiency, it makes their, the, the pigmentation look better. I don't know, it's crazy, but in, 2012, John Hopkins did a test and they just took like random samples from poultry from six different states and then they threw China in there, I guess, just to, to see how they st stacked up. But they, what they found is that 100% of the samples of poultry had arsenic in them. 100%. I don't know if I need to tell you, like, would you just give your, your kid arsenic? Probably not. That's what we're doing when they're eating chicken that's not organic. Um, the majority had acetaminophen, which is the active ingredient in Tylenol. We talked about it last week and the week before. You know, our kids already have low levels of glutathione. Tylenol, acetaminophen lowers that, increases oxidative stress, causes damage in the brain. So we're eating that in our food supply and having a constant stream of it. No bueno. And 33% had Benadryl in there. It's just crazy. Now the China samples, they also had Prozac. So they must have, the birds must have been anxious. So they had to, you know, give them a little Prozac to calm them down a little bit. And I get it guys, buying organics can be a little bit more money than buying conventional. And I know it seems like I'm just like beating you over the head with this stuff. And there's a reason for that. It's because I am. We need to collectively stop poisoning our children by accept, accepting what these companies are putting into our food supply. And that's one way that we can do it. Okay, when it comes to produce, the biggest problems are GMOs and pesticide residue. Now, for GMOs, you really don't have to worry about four right now when it comes to produce. That's zucchini, yellow squash, Hawaiian papaya, and sweet corn. In terms of pesticide residue though, that's a different story because there's over 400 chemical pesticides that are routinely used in conventional farming. And the majority of which are known to cause cancer or other issues with nervous system, learning disabilities, endocrine systems, all that stuff. And since children in general are more susceptible because they're, you know, small arm stature, so they've got a little small body, they have immature nervous and endocrine systems, these, <laughs> these chemicals cause even more issues. Now you take our children that have compromised immunity and everything else, it's like double trouble. So for the love of God, buy organic, please, for the sake of that. Now this, this uh, chart I have here is from Kelton Nutrition. These guys are awesome. Uh, they have some incredible books. Look them up if you're interested in this stuff. And I will work on putting a, I think they have a download like this that I can put into the members area and I was just talking to my sister about it today. She actually uh, has a picture of this in her phone. And whenever she's buying produce, she wants to look and use it as a resource. So basically what this is, is based on how things are, are raised, there could either be more or less pesticide content in. For instance, when you're buying bananas, that's not as crucial to buy organic as if you're buying apples or celery or strawberries or blueberries or spinach or things like that. So, Usually it's like things with like an outer shell, pineapples and avocados. Um, what I would suggest you do is just take an avocado, I call it the avocado test. Take one avocado that's organic and one that's not and just taste them at the same time. And the organic ones taste way better. I didn't believe it until I tried it. But you can use this as a guide. Like I said, I'll put it in the members area. All right, eggs. Now, eggs are one of the best foods that we can feed our children. Uh, the issue with eggs is just that there's so many different terms used to market them. It's just really confusing. 
So, you know, people say that pastured eggs and cage free and all this stuff. So I'm just going to walk through those labels real quick to give you an idea of a guideline for when you're out in, at the store. Now, pastured eggs do have a lot more nutrients. The yolks are much deeper in color and they're packed full of more vitamins, omega-3s, and all the really good stuff for our children's brains. I don't know if you guys have ever had like an actual farm egg and seen what it looks like on a pan, but the yolk is this deep, deep like orange color. It's amazing. Anyway, um, organic, what this means is that they can't use genetically modified feed. It's free of antibiotics and pesticides. And they have outdoor access, but there are no real time minimums. So they'll have a door, they can go out and not. Uh, pasture raised, that's an unregulated term. So it's just a marketing term, but they have to spend at least some time roaming free in pastures, which like I said, they can eat grubs, things like that, which make the eggs more nutritious. Cage free, uh, they're kept out of cages, but they generally have no access to the outdoors. So if you look at these pictures, the one on the left, Oh, the one on the left has the birds in cages, and then on the right is they have, you know, they're cage free. Doesn't mean they're that much better of a living environment, but at least they can walk around and, uh, you know, get their wings going and stuff like that. All right, the next one is free range. Same thing, there's really no standard of use. It just implies, the name implies that they get some yard time. And then the next two are just funny because it's 100% vegetarian head and no hormones. And you'll see that used as a marketing message. And it's funny because chicken's natural diet is to eat bugs and grubs in nature, but you know, we're just feeding them 100% vegetarian fed head, you know, vegetarian. Now that's better than eating animal byproducts, but, but still it just, it's like, hey, we're feeding them a diet that's not natural. And no hormones. That's just funny because there's no hormones approved. So it's like, of course. So they're just saying, hey guys, we're not breaking the law. All right, that said, eggs and chickens do a really decent job of processing toxins. So buying the most expensive egg is not as critical as let's say buying organic meats. So my test is always the frying pan. And I did this, I literally bought like two different types of eggs for a month and a half where I just would, Crack, and once they were done, I'd crack two, and I would see which one had the deeper yolk. And the other thing is when you crack them, the shell on the eggs that have more nutrients is a lot harder. So that's, I just do, do with that and found one that I like, and that's the one I typically go with. All right, so when it comes to dairy, my recommendation is to stay away completely. Like we talked about this the past few weeks and I don't really know of any situation where feeding our children cow's milk or milk products besides grass fed butter is appropriate for our children. I just really don't. That said, if you, you know, need to have cheese or something like that, I recommend looking for grass fed and raw, which means it's unpasteurized and organic. And if you can't find that, just make sure it's organic limit the quantity, and then add in the digestive enzymes that I told you, and that'll help break down and process the body, or, you know, the food in our, the kid's body. Yogurt, things like that. I just say stay away because artificial dyes, color, sugar, it's just, it's just a mess. So plenty of milk alternatives if you want to get that taste. There's coconut milk, almond milk, my recommendation here is organic and get the unsweet kind. You don't want to be just, you know, loading up on sugar when you're attempting to do something healthy. Now we went over snacks last week, so I'm going to keep this nice and short. Just go over a few of the ground rules. Remember, it's principles, not exactly. So natural snacks are the best. These are raw nuts, fruit, things like that. But if you're buying packaged, I have three simple rules of thumb. One, low number of ingredients right? Pronounceable ingredients and no added sugar. You do those things and you're good to go. And I have the example here of the RX bar. Why? Just because it has the ingredients right on the front of the package, which is super convenient because you don't even have to turn it over and look at what's in it. It's right on the front. All right. Now, one of the hardest parts of a lifestyle change is dealing with family. Grandparents who show their love through bad food, have you guys, you guys seen this phenomenon before? Cousins who think you're crazy, 
who say it doesn't matter, you guys will encounter resistance, trust me. And the best way to overcome those hurdles, letting them see results. That's it, once my family saw how well my son was doing, this was no longer an issue. They came together to help. They asked me for shopping lists, it was incredible but it took them seeing the results. And the other pro the byproduct of that is you'll start, I mean, just for yourself, you guys are gonna start to feel and look better, which also catches people's attention. And then before you know it, when you're sitting out in the lobby of ABA therapy, other pa parents will be asking you what you did because they'll see your kid progressing faster and faster. And that's how this spreads, guys. This is how we can continue to help kill more children. We just have to continue to elevate our level of consciousness as it relates to food and our environment. And it just creates that ripple effect out in our families, in our communities, and everything else. So what's happening next? First thing, homework. Download the, the Healthy Living app. It is free. No excuses, guys. And then implement and bring your questions. Okay, how many of you guys worked on your homework from last weekend or from last week? Next week, we're gonna be doing something a little different, which I'm really excited about. We're gonna be going through some content, but then what we're gonna do is it's gonna be a workshop. So we're gonna be working on specific challenges and answering any questions you have, putting uh, plans together. So I want you to go come back with what you've implemented, the results you're having, the challenges you're facing, and we will just walk through it together. So this may be something if you're out and about and you're driving and you're just kind of listening, kind of half into it, this will be something where you could come in and you know, turn your camera on, share what's going on. If that scares you, you don't have to do that. But this class and my coaching will not be free forever. And my suggestion is to take advantage of me as much as you can. I'm here, I'm willing. I want you guys to succeed more than anything. And you have this incredible opportunity here. And I just really, really encourage you guys to take advantage of it. And like I said before, this is a whole, this whole thing is a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. This is a lifestyle shift. This is not something where, you know, you just do for a week or two. But my suggestion is, you know, if you're still skeptical and I, I don't, really know how you could be if you've been with us since the beginning, but give it 30 days. See what happens. You know, I, I think you guys will be definitely